All right, next up we have Angus talking about Prusep, a new security isolation mechanism for OpenStack. Uh, please make him feel welcome. All right, yes, that's me. Uh, don't talk about myself. Um, I'm Angus. I work as an OpenStack developer for Rackspace. Um, work on upstream OpenStack, usually on Neutron, but bits and pieces everywhere. Um, Right now, I'm talking about a new project which we're working through the Oslo process to get it made up now, and um, it's a new privilege separation framework. So I was going to talk a little bit about the history, what the background, what is privilege separation, what's the problem we're trying to solve. Um, this is an evolution of root wrap, so I'm going to talk about the root wrap history um, and how we got here, and then I'll talk a little bit about uh, the new thing, um, basically. So, here's the problem. We have, when you're designing a service, you've got your actual service. Uh, in most cases, particularly OpenStack, that's uh, kind of a, a bastion between the users out there on the internet somewhere, and they talk to your service over the internet, and then the whole purpose of them talking to you is that eventually your service will do stuff. Um, and it's gonna do things typically uh, creating virtual machines, reading certain protected files, on whatever on that machine that the user themselves can't do because they're out on the internet somewhere. That's obviously the architectural view, as the software developer says. If you're a security person, you look at it more like this. So <laughs> you have to assume that your piece of software has some bugs somewhere in it that you don't know about yet. And the challenge here is that we're trying to design a defense. We're trying to design with the idea that there are bugs there, but how do we reduce the impact of those? How do we make it so that fewer of those bugs actually turn into exploiting access to the stuff that matters? All right. The basic principle with privilege separation is that you minimize the amount of code which can actually get to the stuff that matters. So you're gonna have bugs there somewhere because you have fewer code, a fewer amount of code that can actually get to the privileged data, whatever it is, there's, more, there's less likely to be interesting bugs in there. It's a small amount of code, smaller bugs. Also, you can focus your reviewing attention on there, so you can look at that bit more carefully while the bulk of your code you can be um, a little more relaxed about. So then to break in to here, your bad person needs to, first of all, subvert your main service. They have to make your main service do something it wasn't going to do normally. Um, you know, buffer overrun, whatever. Um, simply reading a file that it wasn't meant to read. Whatever you can do to make it behave differently. And then they have to turn that into an exploit against the privileged portion of that code, the, the privilege boundary B in this case. So they need to basically have two exploits in order to get to the stuff that matters. Um, and hopefully that's a lot harder than just getting the one exploit. Um, you have to assume, which is a little... C programmers are more used to thinking about this because when you get a buffer overrun, you pretty much own that whole process. The same bugs still exist in Python. If there is, if you're calling into NumPy or something, um, there's still a chunk of C code there that wasn't part of the core Python string routines, there's still the opportunity for there to be buffer exploits in there, just as there would be in other languages. So you have to assume that when someone has exploited your program, they can do anything that your program can do. They can re make your program behave differently, they can take over ownership of that program, and they can make it do anything that that program itself was able to do. So if this was, say, Nova Compute, then whatever your Nova Compute process can do, an evil user who's taken over that can also do. So, yeah, privilege separation, we're using the kernel primitives to limit uh, what's possible, to put a boundary around that and say, well, that's okay. You've taken over user ID Nova service, but that user still can't read etc. shadow. They still can't reformat the hard disk. They still can't um, do whatever. Okay, so here's the idea. Privilege separation, we produce a separate piece. Previously, in OpenStack. Originally, this was run by your, your regular service would run as a normal unprivileged user with no special privileges. 
um, except for it has the one ability to be able to run sudo for certain commands. So your privilege separation, if you like, becomes the regular Nova process and then the sudo mechanism to run some things as root. And originally, you would slowly build up more and more commands here that that user was allowed to run as root. Um, and this works fine. Uh, it's, it's obviously an obvious extension of what you would do as you know a script or something that a, a sysadmin might do. Sudo is a very easy to understand, familiar tool for, for this sort of problem. The problem that this approach ran into was eventually sudo has became really long and hard to manage. Um, you can drop in little files into most distros that have a sudo as .d directory, but by and large, it's a fairly awkward thing to have to maintain uh, for, for a large list of things. So the second attempt was to add root wrap, and I hope it doesn't really matter if that's not large enough to see, but um, we added a, a new intermediate command called root wrap. This... Uh, so you would run sudo, and then root wrap, and then the command you actually wanted to run. So you now had only one entry in the sudo as file, that is, let me run root wrap. And then root wrap itself had a more expressive um, configuration file that was more under the control of the OpenStack developers. And they could use that to describe the other commands you're allowed to run. And they could hopefully be a little more suited to the sorts of commands and the sorts of security checks that OpenStack wanted to run. And here's two examples that I've pulled off the uh, Nova um, default root wrap filters. Um, the first one is simply let me run mount as root. The syntax is a little quirky. It's a, a, a simple a string that just identifies this line for no real reason. Um, this is the sort of filter you want to run. This is a particular Python object that enforces the check. This is the most common one. Uh, this is the command you want to run, and this is the, or you want to allow to be able to be run. And this is the user you want to run it as. Um, almost all of them are root. There's few cases where you want to run as a different user. Um, here's a more advanced filter, regex filter. So this will let you run this command as this user, um, provided it matches the arguments match. That's argv1. And this argument matches this regex filter in this case. So that's a slightly unusual command. Most of them are more like this form here, which is pretty simple. There's a few other filters. There's a, like a kill filter. Let me kill certain process IDs that are running as certain users. Um, uh, there's a few special ones for running IP commands. Let me run an IP command, but not a net ns exec. And there's the reverse. Let me run just IP net ns exec sub commands. Um, and of course, you can add new ones if you wanted to. So this is the root wrap extension. Um, this has worked pretty well for a number of years. This has been the state of the art in OpenStack. Um, it recently, particularly with Neutron, um, which is where I sort of started thinking about this problem, um, a lot of what Neutron does is running one-liner IP commands. A lot of the things Neutron needs to do is trivial little network configuration. So it's running an IP, an IP root one-liner command. Um, and it might run it many times. So this becomes expensive. You're firing off sudo, you're firing off root wrap, which is a whole Python program that has to start up. Python has quite a slow startup cost while it slurps in all these different files and things like that. Um, and then you're running your real command that you actually wanted to run. This is quite expensive. So, so a new thing that's come around sort of in the last cycle um, is root wrap daemon. And the idea here is we use sudo to start root wrap daemon, and then root wrap, root wrap daemon hangs around. So it has a connection channel back to the original process, and it will just exec commands repeatedly, and root wrap daemon itself is only started up once. Uh, so this actually works pretty well. Um, it's a very simple change, very easy migration. You just run this instead of your regular root wrap command. Uh, and then the magic is all hidden in the... the Python um, library used to actually take advantage of this, uh, but then it understands exactly the same filters. Um, very easy to migrate to. 
this, the original, just to give you an idea, the uh, spec that proposed this has some benchmarks, and they were getting a 10 times speed up over simply running um, pseudo root wrap IPA, running it through IPA through this mechanism was, was 10 times faster, uh, which is pretty good. This is a little complicated. Uh, so here's, this is, I think of these things as diagrams, so I was trying to describe this visually as well. Here's our main process. Um, we've started root wrap daemon, we do that once somewhere early on, like the first time we try to invoke one of these commands. Root wrap daemon writes a randomly generated token to standard out. Okay, so the, the, the main process can read that standard out. It now knows this, this magic token. Uh, later on, it connects to a particular well-known Unix socket, and it uses that token to say, I'm, I'm who you think I am, I should be able to talk to you. It then sends the command line it wants to run down the socket, serialized using JSON. Uh, root wrap daemon then goes off and executes the command. When it returns, it gets its standard out, standard error that came from this command and the actual exit code and sends them back down the Unix socket. Um, fairly straightforward, there's a number of steps there. The actual mechanism's fairly straightforward. And then this bottom part repeats every, every new command you want to run. Uh, it actually uses the multiprocessing library, Python multiprocessing library, which is a little unusual. Um, but it uses multiprocessing. Um, multiprocessing normally has a, a client and the server sort of part. The server part forks off lots of different workers. That's the whole point of multiprocessing. Uh, and then you send commands, it's basically a queue, and the commands get run, and then it returns the result. That uses that same mechanism here. You can see that same shape here. It's sending commands, they're running here, so this is a multiprocessing, multiple processes, and then they're sending back responses. Um, and a little bit, uh, when you go look at the code for root wrap daemon, a little bit of the quirky bits in the code is because it's working in and around multiprocessing, but multiprocessing does also give it a lot of things for free, uh, which is what it wants, so it's not too bad. Um, so this is pretty good. Um, I'd like to call out particularly, because it'll come up later on, just here somewhere, there's a little bit of uncertainty in root wrap daemon. Root wrap daemon has started up, it's written its token to stand it out, and now it hangs around. How long does it hang around for? When should it exit? So there's a little bit of ambiguity here, um, and eventually this, this has a, 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 some code that, that kills this process when it's finished with it. Um, but there's, if this died really hard, it wouldn't be able to send a kill signal to here. So this could hang around for too long. There's, there's different, various cases where this can get leaked. Um, and likewise, this little first start part there, it's also hanging around. Maybe something has gone horribly wrong in the main process. How long do we hang around? We don't really know. So that's one issue with that communication method. The other thing is, when you're running commands, there's no real, you don't have enough context. Okay, you're asking me to trim out a file, why are you asking me? Is it appropriate that I allow you to trim out this file right now? Um, and these are real ones. These are real lines from compute filters in Nova. I'm not sure if you can work out, but can you, if you did take over control of the Nova process, do you think you could find a way to subvert these to then get root? <laughs> you can run DD with any arguments. You can run CP with any arguments as root. If you can't get root with these commands, you're not trying very hard. <laughs> so basically, unfortunately, despite all this mechanism, we've basically meant that anyone who exploits our Nova compute service has root anyway. This really isn't a barrier. It's just an annoyance when you're actually writing the code. It doesn't actually provide that much security. It would be possible to go through here and say, CP with file names matching this regex, DD with arguments matching this regex, but no one's done that because that's really hard. And it's not going to adapt properly when someone installs compute, Nova Compute with a non-standard prefix directory. If your images are stored in home, foo, something you didn't think about, that's probably not going to match the regex, in which case you're going to have to go back here and rewrite all of these. It's not going to change automatically based on your configuration. Um, and for some things like Chmod, it's really hard. That's such a low-level command. It's really hard to say, you want to change this file to this 
uh, permissions. Is that appropriate now? What's the bigger picture? What are you actually trying to do? So there's not enough context here to make a proper security decision. Also often, these are command lines. The interface to the command line wasn't meant to be the security boundary, the actual command line itself. So the command lines don't have the sorts of things you would want if that was going to be your security entry point. So a good example is IP. IP is a wonderfully powerful command. lets you do all sorts of things with networking. But it's really hard to say, I only want you to do these certain things with networking, or only if you're this user, or only dealing with this particular type of interface. And you simply can't describe those things on the command line. It was never meant to be used like that. Um, and uh, as a further one, there, it's, it's clumsy. You're running commands, so you're having to generate command lines, and you're having to regex parse output. To give you an idea, the IP lib uh, wrapper is 800, well, it's like 830 lines or so of Python code just to generate IP command lines and regex parse the results. Uh, and there's also, because the output changes, it's meant to be human readable, not machine readable. Um, even with a, a relatively low level command like IP, there's still code in there that has to deal with different versions and recognizing different output as it's changed slightly over the years for the IP command. Um, which is all just a bit clumsy. It'd be much better if there was a programmatic interface for these things. Uh, and as I said earlier, yeah, a lot of what Neutron does is single line IP commands. This is running sudo root wrap, or, or even in the root wrap daemon case, you're still execing a fresh IP command to run what is fundamentally a single Netlink syscall, which is a lot of overhead compared to what it could be in some other world. Even in Python, there's not actually a lot of code between you and running a syscall. <laughs> so it, anyway, the overhead is noticeable. So this is uh, the new thing that's being worked on in Oslo, uh, and I'm one of the main people pushing this. Um, it is what I'm trying to do is change the API. Instead of talking about command lines, we're going to talk about Python function calls. And so I want to run a Python function call as a privileged user. So I can now write some Python that encapsulates a little bit more of what I wanted. Instead of chmod, it's now change the owner, change this file that came from this VM to the user that I'm running Nova as, for example. So there's a lot more context there. You know that you're doing what you should be doing. Uh, you can see, you, you can automatically look up the configuration, know the subdirectory that has files belonging to the virtual machine, you know the user Nova is running as, so you can do just that operation without having to worry about is this the right Shamod call or not. Um, also, as you can see with the previous ones, people weren't really, the idea was you would develop more and more root wrap filters over time to better express what it is you wanted. But of course, that's not what happened. Everyone just uses command filter because it's hard to write a new filter. So it must be easy for people to use securely. Otherwise, they're not going to. And while we're at it, we may as well take advantage of some newer Linux kernel features, uh, like capabilities in particular, but SE Linux and whatever else comes along. Um, it would be nice if we could use these things. Um, while we're using sudo, it's a little bit hard because whatever you thought you had, sudo kind of punches a hole through that and says, okay, now we're back to full root privileges. So, here's what we've got. Um, on the Adding a new function should be as easy as adding a function. Make it really easy, make it really normal. So on the privilege side, this is the, this, um, the spec's still in discussion. The actual syntax of this changed uh, earlier this week. <laughs> so this is the new version, um, but this is still evolving. Um, so on the privilege side, we have some sort of top level directory, top level package. In this example, neutron privileged. Um, and you would just create Python modules below that. Just to make it easier to audit, the privileged functions have to live below this sort of particular prefix, particular directory prefix, particular Python package prefix, uh, just so you can look in one place to find all the privileged code. Uh, in here, you import this neutron privileged. There's a magic under under init, which I'll get to on the next slide. And then you decorate your function that you want to be your entry point. 
So you can have regular functions here. They can't be called from the, the unprivileged code. Anything you decorate with this can be called across the privileged boundary. So this is your kind of entry point. On the unprivileged side, just like normal. You just import it as if it was a regular mod Python module, and you just call it as if it was a regular Python function. Okay? All the magic is in this decorator. So it looks nice and normal. Static analysis tools should be okay with it. Uh, very easy to extend. These are both in the same um, Git repository, so there's no kind of release management issues. If you want to add a new feature here, you can take advantage of it here immediately within the same git change. Now, here's the magic. Once per project, someone types out this, and you have this under under init file, and this imports uh, from the Oslo project, uh, and it declares the decorator like this. So it runs, I think, sets up a decorator. And this is that same decorator using elsewhere. So this is um, uh, the configuration section which the various bits of config should appear under. Um, this is allowing for, it's possible to have more than one decorator in your program, for some reasons I'll get to later. Um, but normally, if you only had one, you wouldn't need to change that. And then we have the default capabilities. So if the s operator, if the deployer doesn't override this, these are the capabilities that the privileged daemon, will, the privileged portion of your code will run with. Uh, so in this case, most of Neutron, like I don't know, 80, 90% of Neutron can get by with just capnet admin. And unfortunately, we need cap sysadmin just to enter the network namespace. Um, which is a bit unfortunate, but that's the way the Linux kernel works. Right, so it's all pretty straightforward. How does it work? So here's, compare this with that version we had earlier from Rootwrap Daemon. You can see immediately there's fewer exchanges here. It's much more straightforward. Um, I'm not having to work within the multiprocessing existing design, so I'm free to come up with some different ways to communicate. We start the proof step helper once on first use, and I'm using root wrap to do so. Um, there's other mechanisms in the, described in the spec and in, implemented in the code, but this is the most compatible version, so this is expected to be the normal way it's used for uh, at least the next few cycles. Um, so once it's startup, we fire off Proofsep helper. Proofsep helper starts as root because it's run through sudo. It immediately goes and finds the configuration, reads the configuration, says, okay, who should I be running as and with what capabilities? And so it keeps those capabilities, drops all the others, and ch changes this user ID away from root. So we're no longer actually running as root, UID zero. I can't read etc. shadow or things, other things that need UID zero. Um, I can't uh, do things that need other capabilities. So, for example, I mightn't be able to load kernel modules or um, mount file systems or something. Um, but I can still do whatever capabilities allow me to do. So, reconfigure networking in the case of NetAdmin. Uh, now, over that same standard in, standard out channel, so there's no need to negotiate anything else. Same standard in, standard out, we just send through function args, keyword args, um, serialize the name of the function and the arguments I want to pass. Um, on this side, it just checks that yes, that function was appropriately decorated in the code, and it was below the, the configured prefix, neutron privileged in my earlier example, and then it just calls the function. Gets the result, serializes the result back across the connection. Yeah, yeah, so I send back either uh, the result serialized or the exception object serialized in some way. Um, these are very deliberately very dumb. The idea is to make it easy to audit. This boundary is where all the security happens, so this should be simple, easy, without features. Um, in particular, I don't allow magic objects to go through here. There's no, you can't make up a new object and have it go through here and have it automatically created on this side using some Python dynamic magic. These are very deliberately dumb, simple data types. So they're all the sort of JSON style um, lists, dictionaries, uh, simple strings, integers. Um, uh, there are a few extra objects because I'm using Oslo serialization. 
which has a few extra data types. It's got a date time type and a UUID type. There's a, a very small set of extra ones, but they're all basic dumb objects, is my point. And the same with the results, you're passing back basic dumb objects. Is the Y format JSON? Is the Y format JSON? Um, it is suggested to be that currently, my initial version used message pack. Uh, during the spec discussion, that got too controversial, so I've gone back to basic JSON as less controversial, but I fully expect to go back to message pack as a separate conversation later. Is it confusing? So the question was, in the code it looks like a regular Python function call. Is it confusing that you won't be able to access variables outside that yeah. Python function in the code? Yes, it probably would be. I'm, I'm expecting that someone implementing this is aware of this mechanism and this separation. And yeah, uh, they are separate processes. So if you mess with globals from the unprivileged side, that change won't be reflected on the privileged side because early on they are yeah, two separate processes. They just look like they're in the same process. Yeah. Can I run multiple proof set processes? Yes, absolutely. And that was the reason earlier on for having the configuration section in the decorator instantiation. Yes. Um, so one of the things, particularly with capabilities, um, you have a particular set of capabilities. What if I want to do something as actual, honest to goodness, UID zero, or something like that? If I, if I have something I need to do uh, in the Neutron case, creating and destroying namespaces needs network namespaces needs a different set of permissions to simply entering them um, due to an unfortunate thing with the way IP root, if you want to be compatible with what IP root does with network namespaces. Um, so we could uh, have two privilege separation daemons, one that has more powers, um, but has a different, presumably smaller set of code associated with it, and another privilege separation daemon that runs as netadmin and has the bulk of the privileged code with it. Um, so yes, it's absolutely possible to do that. Um, now, as an example, when I f did some simple benchmarks with this using message pack as my serialization, um, and I was doing the equivalent of um, IPA. So on this side, this is just Python. Uh, and it's a persistent Python process. It's not a short-lived one. So you can do just regular Python library things. So in my case, I was using a PyRoot2, which is a quite um, comprehensive Python library to make netlink calls. And I was doing the netlink call that is give me the addresses, so it's the, the, the equivalent of IPA done as the actual kernel netlink call. And if I compare simply execing IPA versus using this whole mechanism to communicate across here, call pyroot2 to do the same, come back there, I was 20 times faster. Which just to put that into perspective makes me 400 times faster than root wrap. And, and about 20 times, uh, 40 times faster than root wrap via root wrap daemon. Yes, Steve? You said that uh, earlier the root wrap daemon dies somewhere. Yep. It gets called into kill. Does the proof separation... Oh, when do I exit? Yeah, good question. So when does, when does my fluid separation process exit? Um, I deliberately... I, I do fate sharing between these two. So when this connection is closed, this exits. Right. So right from the very beginning, it has stand in, stand it out. If anything kills this, even if it exits uncleanly due to you know out of memory by the kernel or something, it'll still close the so close that standard in pipe. This guy will still know about it. This guy will still exit. There's no ambiguity here, um, and vice versa. If this exits for some reason, I make no attempt to restart it. The assumption here is, apart from making the code simpler, the assumption is the only reason this would exit is because something scary is happening, and you probably don't want to keep respawning it and give the attacker a free hit, again, a free kick again, right? Um, the downside is that if this does exit, you've got a partially misfunctioning server now. So you, you want that to be loud, you want to fail catastrophically, you want to be fairly over the top about that. Yep. Why standard in, standard out versus, say, a dedicated socket pair and let you actually use the debugger? Why standard in, standard out versus socket pair? Yes, yes, I agree, um, absolutely. So this is mostly to work within the existing root wrap deployment approach. Um, so originally I had three versions implemented and you could choose which one you wanted. The end result is all the same. You end up with the privilege process running with a communication channel backwards and forwards. Um, so this one's nice and simple, pseudo, standard in, standard out. 
I had a second one which has since been dropped as being unnecessary, um, where I passed a Unix socket path on the command line and then immediately connected back to that and had the connection open. Um, that I implemented that originally so that this could work under root wrap daemon, which has the constraint that the command it runs must be short-lived and can't use, can't stream over standard in, standard out. So I negotiated a second channel to actually do the communication, and once that was set up, my command forked and exited so the original command could exit quickly. Um, in discussion over the spec, it turned out that this wasn't important enough to keep as a, a version versus all the complexity that arose and concerns over how the Unix socket was negotiated and how that might be attacked. Um, the third version, third uh, alternative, is much more like what a regular Unix process does. So in this one, I simply assume I'm started with all the privileges I need. So when you start SSHD, uh, it's started by systemd or, or whatever. It's run already with lots of privileges. And the first thing it does is, well, after it's finished its setup, it drops its privileges to run as an unprivileged user. That's the normal way things work on Unix. And so in this way, you would start with full privileges. You would immediately fork off the privileged worker, sorry, create a socket pair, fork off the, the, the uh, privileged worker, and then the unprivileged guy would drop all of his privileges. So you would end up in the same situation but at no point did you use sudo. This would be more like the normal Unix daemon. Uh, the way to do this is still in the code, and it's very easy. Simply, if that is invoked first of all, then it'll continue to work like that. Uh, and if it's not, then it'll use this on the first access. Um, I don't want to push that right now, because that's a much bigger change, particularly to deployment and documentation, um, and not something I want to overcomplicate the discussion with right now. Uh, is the reason why not? I'm, I'm not sure how eager the take up on that will be. What were the performance differences between the different versions of the benchmark? You were talking about the. Oh, the end result of all of these is the same. You have either a Unix pipe or a Unix socket, but they're basically at the same speed to send a message down. Um, uh, so there's no real difference in setup. You only pay the setup once, once it's set up, there's no difference in speed. Um, the end result. Yeah, mostly because you're using a proper library here and you're using a native kernel, uh, native method to talk to the kernel rather than execing command lines. That's where the speed benefit comes from. And simply the overhead of running IPA, even though it's a C command and all the rest, was much more than simply just the single netlink call. And that was about 20 times faster in my simple benchmark. Yeah. Um, Oh, also the other thing here is there's no, uh, you'll also notice that there's no communication channel exposed to this command. There's no entry point into the privilege process um, that's exposed in the file system. There's no Unix socket that's waiting for connects. There's no having to check a password. It's simply standard in, standard out, which no one else can ever look at, can, can attack from the outside. Um, yes, this was the fork and socket pair version, so broadly similar. Um, except they're using a Unix socket now, which is created by the socket pair, and you forked to create it earlier. So this was the other alternative version. Yes. Yeah. Um, from the operator's point of view, not much changes. Um, you need a new root wrap filter using the sudo root wrap approach to start. This is just another command here that is going to be run. Um, we get this new configuration section. The name of this is what was in the uh, decorator constructor. Am I way over time? Yeah. All right. Um, the user you want to run as, the group you want to run as, the capabilities you want to run it as. Um, these default to root, but in the most paranoid setup, you would create a new user ID that was different to the regular unprivileged user ID and was not root. Uh, and you would run your privileged daemon as that. Um, and if you're having multiple Privsev daemons, you'd have one of these for each one, and they'd run as a different unique user. So this doesn't scale very well to lots of users, but will scale to two or three just fine. Um, status as a working prototype was written as a change against Neutron. Um, and the spec is in review. Um, I went to a session in Vancouver where there was 
remarkably little disagreement with the approach. Um, uh, and we're in the moment, in the process at the moment of creating the Oslo project to implement this. Um, it can coexist with root wrap, so the migration is actually pretty straightforward. You have uh, create a new set of code using this mechanism, and then you slowly migrate the callers across from using root wrap uh, to using the new privilege mechanism, and then eventually remove your root wrap um, filters rules and whatever else you no longer need. Um, so it's pretty boring. We've already had a bunch of questions on our way over time, but if there are any left, you can come in now. Otherwise, look me up later. Time for a quick question if someone has one. Excellent. All right. Thank you, Gus. Thank you.